That's... Well, thank you, Colleen. A beautiful arrangement there. She always finds such lovely music for us to listen to, and those of us that come early, come early so we can hear Colleen play those lovely pieces. So I know. Yes, or get donuts and coffee. They're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's great to have you here this morning. Thank you for coming and joining us. I hope if you're along the center aisle, you grabbed up those pew pads and signed in. Let us know you're here. We always appreciate that bit of, of part of the morning routine. And yes, after church, come on down for uh, donuts, coffee, tea, juice. Um, just hang out and be in fellowship with one another. It's, I think, a good part of the Sunday morning routine as well. Uh, we've got Advent happening. Oh my gosh, it's happening over. Did you notice the poinsettias this morning? Oh my gosh. I think these are like bushes. They're not even plants. They're somewhere between a plant and a tree. They're beautiful. They are, they're just humongous. Costco. God bless Costco. I'm telling you, we are so fortunate. Thanks to Tom and Linda Morrissey for working that out and the other folks at the worship committee to get them decorated. You can still sign up for one of these. There's poinsettia envelopes in your bulletin this morning. We're still taking names in honor and memory of our loved ones, um, to which you will put a printed version out later this, uh, probably on the fourth Sunday, I think, we'll print it up. And then after Christmas is over, if you've got one of those dedications done, I believe you are entitled to take one of these home with you. So we'll uh, encourage you to do that. There's still some of that, still some, some of that thinking going on. Also, speaking of gifts that we're giving one another, uh, Giving Tree is our longstanding tradition where we provide gifts for the children in our southwest part of town out there by the school, R.L. Stevens. Uh, many of you have bought gifts already. I saw some wonderful presents packaged, packaged up in the offices. Uh, there's still, I think, there were this morning about three or four more tags on the tree when I came up this morning. Uh, so we'd like to get those finished up today because uh, Monday they'll start the sorting process and begin to get uh, figured out where those gifts are going to go. So if you've got a tag already, thank you. We need those gifts back today, preferably tomorrow at the latest. If you, if you feel inclined to grab an extra tag or if you haven't had a chance to get a tag, would you do so this morning so we don't uh, have any child left out, no child left behind as a as thing. And then uh, the rest of this week is just chock-a-block full. If this week especially seems to have much going on, so I'm going to ask you to get out your card, which has the advent calendar of activities on there. And... Uh, it's on the back side of your carrying card if you're looking at with, at with me. And just right off the top, there's a luncheon at noon today over at Stony Point. Uh, people often are surprised at who goes to our church or that they're still going to our church or that they've never met before because they only go to one service. And uh, we get stuck in that kind of routine so often, so easily. But here's these opportunities to kind of go across town, across congregation, if you will, and see different folks in their church life. So at noon today, uh, thereabouts after the service is over at Stony Point, stop by for a, a bowl of soup, piece of bread, some crackers, good fellowship, and, and say hello to folks that you don't get to see very often. I mentioned the giving tree that's on the card. I already mentioned that. Uh, the potluck luncheon, the, the great annual tradition of the United Methodist women, all are welcome to join us for that at noon with delightful foods and carols and messages. It's just a fun way to spend some time together for lunch on Tuesday. And then Tuesday night, we have the Christmas carol. Now, there's a few people in this hall right now who are actually involved in this rendition of the Dickens story. This is kind of a, an abridged version. They have read it to us over the years. They're doing it this year without books. That means that they have to memorize all that Dickinson language. It's being directed by a man in the back of the room named Michael Welch. Michael, we have an arm in the air. There's Michael back there. He's been doing this for several years through the Senior Center. I can't remember which one it is, but is it the Finley? the Finley Senior Center. So it's really, a, it's really a project of the community. We get to get them because Michael's involved and because another guy's involved who's wearing a bright red sweater this morning, so it's hard to miss. Norm Bryan's involved right there, too. So we have an illustrious community of thespians in our midst Tuesday night. Yeah, yes, yes, I do. I do, Faye. <laughs> uh, 6.30. Actually, come at 5.45 for dinner. When's the last time you were at Spirit Cafe? I bet you it's been a while. If you haven't been there for a while, come on by, have a dinner with us. We'd love to see you it's at 5.45. We'll, we'll come over here to the sanctuary at 6.30 for the message that night. Nomadic Shelter is Friday. Uh, gosh, it's just a season of much going on. And on, on one other thing I need to bring to your attention, it's on the uh, bulletin uh, inside. It says Christmas Eve worship service schedule. Just to alert you that because Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday, we've got a lot of services that are different times going on. I uh, hope you can keep track of all of that in the course of your... Season planning, much to, much to celebrate this time of year. 
Well, that's it for me. I think we're going to take ourselves right into our opening song. Uh, it's the great melody and message of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. As you're able, let's stand and sing together. in a responsive reading this morning. It is on our screen. It's number 205 in our books. I'd like to uh, use this Advent melody, response one, that Colleen's going to play for us to get us set up. Uh, we'll sing through it, and then we'll begin the words that are shared in this reading of Canticle of Light and Darkness. So, Colleen, let's, let's hear this melody. <laughs> Let's try that together. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great And let's try that. Let's sing that one more time. It goes like this. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great And together we read aloud the first set of words. We look for light but find darkness. For brightness the walk in gloom. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. If I say, 
Let only darkness cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Blessed be your name, O God, forever. You reveal deep and mysterious things. You are a light, and in you is no darkness. Our darkness is passing away, and already the true light is shining. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. And now we light our second candle of our season of Advent, the candle of love. In this Advent, we are hoping for <clears throat> this Advent, we are hoping for renewal and rebirth in our community. In starting anew, our hope is that we would do as Jesus taught, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. After a year of unimaginable, many of us are at our very end. Here, at the end, we come back to the beginning, to this season of beginnings, to fresh starts and restarts. Emmanuel, who brought love into the world, come into the world again. Restart the love in our hearts. Tell me. And uh, we'll actually pass that right over to Lindsay, who's uh, leading our children's time this morning. We'll invite our boys and girls forward now to share in the message. So today um, I brought um, I brought this Advent wreath. What shape is the Advent wreath? What shape? Yeah, it is a circle, it's a, and it goes on and on and on, and it symbolizes that that God's love and Jesus' love for us goes on and on and on for eternity, and rings go on and on. There's no end to it. If, if there was a tiny creature walking around and they wanted to come to the end, there would be no end at all. And um, why do we call this an Advent wreath? Why is it? What does Advent mean? Do you know what Advent means? <laughs> oh, the coming of Jesus. Advent, uh, um, advance. So the coming of Jesus. And so we've got this Advent wreath and the circle of eternity. Oh, and the circle of eternity. And we have, this is our second um, Sunday of Advent, and so we've lit two candles now. We do this, we have this on our dining room table. So we, ha we lit this one, as you see, it's shorter, and it's going to get, it's going to be really short because we'll light it every single time. And then we've lit this one. Sometimes this, the second candle is called the candle of light because it's getting lighter and Jesus is the light in our life. And light also was represented by the star that led the wise men to Jesus. So light, it's very important to us this season. Every faith pretty much has light for, um, for, for the true Jesus. 
And so we, that's, these are the symbols that we think about um, the second Sunday of Advent and, in, and indeed during this season. So when you look at, a, when you look at an Advent wreath and you think, look at the circle and you, th you see the wreaths on people's doors, it's the internal love of Jesus. And the candles are the light that lead us the way. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for this season of love and renewing and hope and light. Keep these warm feelings in our heart as we go about our daily activities and think about your love as never ending, just like the circle, it goes on and it is eternal. Thank you in his name, amen.
morning. Good morning. I'm reading from this new Revised Standard Version, The Righteous Reign of the Coming King. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy of the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as the day of Mendon. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled into blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulder, and he is named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, his authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Would you join with me in prayer? May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. So I have already done my Christmas decorating for the year. It's a matter of going into the garage, getting out the two crumpling uh, cardboard boxes. I don't know why we nev I never replaced those. I don't know if anyone else did. These are originals, circa late 1970s, early 1980s, whenever it was that my parents first put this stuff in the boxes. And now I have inherited those treasures that other members of my family did not want. I'll tell you, it is an eclectic menagerie of Christmas stuff. <laughs> 
the prize possession, though, is our original nativity scene. You can bring it up here on the slide. It is classic. These are two and a half inches high, all plastic, made in the 70s, so there's probably some asbestos in there. Brightly, <laughs> brightly colored. And as a child, it was one of my jobs. I got to get them out and, and set them up and set up the wise men farther away and maybe move them over as they went. And then at the end of the season, it was my job to also take these little plastic figurines and put them in the plastic that they came in that was also covered in plastic because that's what we did, right? We remember this. And um, I guess our set didn't have a sheep either. I think Dusty, the dog, ate the sheep. You can check in with my parents later. Um, but I remember one year in particular, the plastic had gotten kind of crumpled. And I couldn't, fit, I couldn't fit the baby Jesus back into the plastic. So I'm trying to jam uh, the Christ child into the vaguely Jesus-sized hole in the plastic. And I remember being upset about this. And I remember sharing this with my dad. And I don't remember the outcome of it. I don't have a vivid memory of what happened next. But I do know that now, anytime I open the box, it's been wrapped in duct tape multiple times. So I think I see what my dad's solution was to the problem. That is, Christ's child go in the little hole, and then the Holy Spirit is like the duct tape that holds it all. <laughs> All together. Sure, why not? The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. If you know this passage, you probably know this passage from Handel's Messiah, and therefore, uh, chances are you associate this text, like many of the texts from Isaiah, with the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. That is the danger in reading Old Testament texts during Advent, that we inductively assume that they are all pointing to the birth of one particular child about 2,000 years ago, and we end up not unlike a young Lindsay Kerr trying to jam, jam Jesus into a vaguely sized Jesus hole that he no longer really fits in. You wondered where I was going with that, but there it is. <laughs> There's a problem with that, actually. One, I don't think Jesus needs us to do that, quite frankly. Jesus needs another prophecy attributed to him, like Michael Phelps needs another gold medal. That is, Jesus has enough, has enough of everything in Scripture pointing to him. Second, when we read this uh, story solely as a prediction of the first Christmas, we make the people in the story passive objects. That is, prior to 2,000 years ago, everyone in all of history was just waiting around, biding time until Jesus was born. The danger in that is if we believe that people are primarily defined by events visited upon them, then we become the kind of Christians who passively, passively wait for Jesus to be born, expecting that when Jesus is born or when Jesus comes again, Jesus will make everything better for us. The birth of Jesus does not make everything better. The birth of Jesus does not even make everything better for the very place where Jesus was born. Has anyone been to the, the Holy Land? Raise your hand. How are things going there? <laughs> I've been to the West Bank. I've, uh, I've been to, uh, to the occupied territories. I've been to uh, Tel Aviv. I have seen the separation wall that has been built in the very land where Jesus walked, and yet there's nothing like hearing a story from someone to sort of open your eyes again. 
Last weekend, there was a conference on Palestine here in Santa Rosa, and there were speakers from all over the world, from places as exotic as Houston, Texas. Someone came from Houston, Texas, a young man named Tarak, who's from Palestine, moved to Houston when he was 12, and is the first Palestinian I've ever heard speak with a drawl and wear gator skin cowboy boots while he talked about Palestine. I'll tell you, friends, it was a cross-cultural experience, indeed. And Tarek talked about how when he was a child, his parents had this property and his dad would walk from the house to the farm and back again. And at a certain point, uh, the Israeli government built the separation wall right in the middle of the property. His father could no longer walk to the farm. His father had to go a long distance and take a checkpoint and then go through. The checkpoints are often closed. It became economically untenable for the family to stay. They moved to the United States when he was 12. When he went back, when he was 24, he saw that property again. You can go to the next slide, Jacob. This is the wall. It's 30 feet high. And he stood, he said, in the shadow of the wall. And he could hear on the other side where his father's farm used to be, he could hear that there was been a pool put in there. It's now a resort area for wealthy Israelis. And he said he stood in the darkness and all of this rage boiling within him, all he could do was put his head against the wall and cry. He said all of this prior to the announcement about Jerusalem now being the home of the US Embassy. How far away is peace now? How far away is peace now? People who walk in darkness, people who stand in darkness, people who face a wall in darkness, rarely get the answers to such questions. People who walk in darkness are people who are not quite sure where this is all going. People who walk in darkness are people who not only can't see in front of them, but can't even really see clearly what they have just been through. People who walk in darkness are not sure what is the unexpected that is about to come out. In the past, it may have been difficult for us to understand the people who walk in darkness. In the past, it may have been difficult for us to understand what it is to be a people who on a community-wide level don't know what's going to happen. In the past, a long time ago, on October 7th, 2017, I would say we wouldn't know what it is to be a people in darkness. I think we have walked in darkness. I think we have walked in darkness together. I think in the past two months, we have fumbled around in the dark trying to figure out what is coming next. I think we don't even really know yet what we have been through. And I think we are still trying to figure out where we will go and how we will get there together. When Tarek climbed onto the stage in those beautiful gator skin cowboy boots, he said, Santa Rosa, I want to, I want to offer you sympathy from the people of Palestine. Just because we have gone through displacement for so long does not mean that we would wish it upon anyone else. I greet you as a brother. People who walk in darkness move step by step and turn by turn. People who walk in darkness, if you've ever been stuck out hiking and you forgot your flashlight, you'll know that it's good to kind of keep both feet on the ground so you don't trip and fall. People who walk in darkness hold on to each other so that they don't get lost. And if you have ever been out in darkness and you found someone else who is lost, you would hold on to them too. People who walk in darkness cleave to one another for a sense of safety and community. 
I don't know if Isaiah 9 is an accurate prediction of the first Christmas. I don't know if Isaiah 9 says anything about Jesus of Nazareth. But Isaiah 9 says a great deal about us. It says a great deal about what it is to be human and to live in uncertain times. And we don't have to fit Jesus of Nazareth neatly into this passage to know that if a passage of scripture says something about us, it also says something about God with us. That is, even if this doesn't predict Jesus of Nazareth coming, it says something about the Christ who is born among us, Emmanuel, God with us, because God does not just love us enough to passively shine light upon us, but God loves us enough to actively journey with us through the darkness. The people who walk in darkness see the light because the light has come to dwell among them. Word made flesh and dwelt among us. The people who walk in darkness are able to walk faithfully because they know that God is in the darkness and walks with us still. God loves us enough not simply to shine a light upon us, but to walk with us in the darkness. If in a time of grief you have ever had two friends, one of whom offers you the it'll be okay, and the other of whom says, this sucks, let me come and sit with you, you know which friendship matters the most. When you walk in darkness, it is not enough for someone to hold up a candle in the distance. What is enough is if someone is with you Emmanuel, God is with us. God loves us enough to be born in the darkness. And God loves us enough to restart love in the darkness. That is, in the birth of Christ, this year in particular, I think we learn something new, not only about how God loves us, but about how we are to love each other. I think this year in particular, we have a greater capacity to walk with those who have also been in darkness, who have also been through the land of unknown, because we ourselves have walked through a great unknown and are walking through it still. The people who walk in darkness are the ones whose eyes can adjust the people who walk in darkness are the ones who begin to see others who are with them and who say, let us walk together. The people who walk in darkness are the ones who understand that light comes from within the darkness, having dwelt in the darkness with us. May the love of God restart love in our hearts this Advent. And may from within this time of deep darkness, may God's light shine through us to the entire world. Amen.
As we prepare to enter into our times of prayers this morning, I invite you to take a moment and pull out the caring corner, renewing our acquaintance with those who've been on our prayers for a while and the folks that have been newly listed into our prayer concerns. This week we learned of the recent hospitalization of Billy Wyckoff, and so I'm sure if you get a chance to call Lolly or um, reach out to Bill, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Also this week we learned of Doris Lorenz entering into hospice. Um, I see Barb's here with Al, hearts go out to you guys. I know this is a difficult time and uh, we're with you in prayers for certain as uh, we pray for Doris and the good life you guys share. Let's take a moment, shall we, and bow our heads. <clears throat> a wonderful counselor, mighty God, our everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, you have been known by so many names from the beginning until the end are the Almighty God. Throughout time and throughout the world, your name has been lifted up in so many languages, and we understand so well that no matter how we name you, you are the one true God, and it is to you we turn now into this time of prayer. For as we have heard in the message so clearly laid out for us, there are times where we do indeed walk in darkness and feel loss. But then you send us the Prince of Peace, the Lord of light and love, to help us through our days, no matter where we are and what we are doing, Jesus is with us, and we thank you, O oh God, for bringing our brother to be here with us in, this, in these days, especially at our time of darkness. We pray for those on our caring corner, those who have meant so much to so many of us, some of whom we don't know, some of whom have been in our prayers for a while, and others are recently in our concerns. And so we know, no matter who's on our heart this morning, that we want to take a moment to lift up our prayer, our personal prayer, for those individuals who are especially tugging at our heartstrings. So in this moment of silence, hear us, O oh Lord. Oh, how well we understand we people of prayer this power that comes when we quietly still our minds and open our hearts to you. For we so fully know that it is in that still silence that you speak to us, that you give us your sense of what you want, that you provide the comfort we need, that you also lift us up. And it is in that personal time of prayer where we most closely find our spirit, that place where all of our dreams and joys, our treasures, our loves, reside, and also the place that we know eternity will forever carry us. And we ask you, O oh God, to strengthen that spirit, especially as we fumble in the darkness, as we seek for others to hold on to, as we cleave into the, un the unknown and the sense of being at a loss. We give praise, O oh God, for the child that was born unto us, that son that was given to us, for the government shall rest upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And so in this time of prayer, as we gather our thoughts around all that is on our hearts, we also lift up our offering, for we understand that it is an outward gesture of the inward expression of gratitude and love that we feel for you, for this church, for the community and the world. Amen.
Would you join with me in prayer? Emmanuel, God with us, we thank you and we praise you. We praise you for this gift of life. We praise you for the gift of incarnation, for the gift of your son, Jesus, the word made flesh, come to dwell among us. We give you thanks for all of creation. We thank you with a portion, a portion of the gifts returned, freely offered. May it be a sign and a symbol and a renewal of our covenant to be, to be your people as you have been our God. We confess to you we have, we have not always been good stewards of your gifts. We have not always cared for the planet, for one another. We have not always followed the instructions of your teaching. We have failed to love our neighbor as ourselves. We confess to you and ask for forgiveness. We ask you to send your love again, to restart love in our hearts, to make us open to receiving your grace and affording grace to one another. We ask you to send your healing spirit upon our community and our world, to send us wisdom, to send us courage, and to send us the boldness to pray as our brother Jesus taught us. Our Father, Mother who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory forever. Amen.
let this be when new life starts, when love restarts, when we find ourselves at the end and also a new beginning, learning to walk in this darkness, to seek each other, to allow the light of God to shine through us now and always. Amen. Thank you.